So Sean Slade, hello, welcome, my friend. Uh, you're such a cool dude, man. I became aware of you through your Rewild My Bio podcast. I know you've been involved in rewilding and also like the scientific connection between human health and nature exposure for a long time. So I've been a big fan. You're also here in Ontario, my home province. And, you know, there's not a lot of rewilders out there, man. So I've been a big, a big fan of yours. And for those just listening, Sean and I did the entire podcast naked. So go look at it on YouTube if what? you want some eye candy. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're two uh quasi well i'm not full ginger sean is a full ginger so if you like naked ginger guys he's the guy for you i'm, I'm my beard comes out of ginger actually i'm proud to say okay. really yeah. eh? Well, yeah that's, that's, uh hence your, your your love for uh vikings and all things uh exactly yeah. well dude people don't know thor was a ginger it's because oh, really? marvel ruined yeah thor oh, was really? a ginger Oh, see, we need that. I uh, see talking about marginalized groups. I have, uh, I have ideas to uh, bring. <laughs> I mean, Hey, as a, gin as a ginger, I've been made fun of a lot as a kid. So to know that Thor is a ginger, it's like a sense of confidence. See, <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. Man. And I think we were both out walleye fishing. Yeah, we were on Thursday. Is that correct? Yeah. Walleye fishing as I, as I grew up calling it pickerel fishing though, right? Being in Ontario, we pickerel, right? It's, it is technically walleye though. So things you learn as you start to rewild as a, an adult onset hunter and fisher and all that stuff, right? Absolutely, man. You know, I know the Canadian way of saying it is pickerel, but dude, I go with walleye. I just think walleye is a cooler name. And you know, when I get out into that kind of environment, you know, outside of the city, it's like two hours outside of Toronto. I still spend half my time in Toronto. And I'm saying to you before, I have the same conversation with people all the time, which is when I get outside of the concrete and into mm -hmm. an environment surrounded by green, immediately I feel my blood pressure drop. And it kind of petered, the conversation peters out after that. It's like, yeah, what a shame. Uh, you know, I wish I could spend all my time in the environment. And right. a lot of people can be dismissive of that. They're like, yeah, well, that sounds like bullshit to me. But what's so interesting about the work that you're doing in your PhD now, man, is that you're looking at measurable metrics about the importance of nature connection. Is that, is that correct? Well, it's, it's not necessarily correct with my PhD work. Now, not said, I definitely have a huge literature view in my dissertation you know, 50 pages talking about some of those metrics as you speak, but I'm a qualitative researcher. So when you said the word, I feel my blood pressure come down, yes. I'm interested in that feeling. I'm not so interested in the actual points that your blood pressure came down. Sure it does, but what's our experience of it? And I think right now in this world, we get away from, we kind of use that rational left brain and we start to think, oh, what is, let's prove that nature is healthy for us with science. But it's like, well, wait a minute, let's go back to the way it feels and how we were always connected to nature, right? Like this idea of being disconnected from nature can only exist because we, over the last however many hundreds of years here, since the scientific revolution, maybe earlier we could say, but I'll say since the scientific revolution, we started to get out of what it feels like to be a human. And we started to think about what it is to be a hu human. So when you say you feel your blood pressure come down, I say right on, because just, uh, just tuning into the body I mean, we are nature, right? So by tuning into our own body, we're tuning into nature essentially, right? So, hey, I'm feeling relaxed. Oh, I'm feeling what it feels like to just be out of my busy mind, out of that busy to-do city. And like you say, you're just on the highway and you see the green and it already happens, right? So, yeah, I mean, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I I'm definitely interested in both sides, quantitative uh, measures of connectedness with nature. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of research done there. So naturally, I I I've immersed myself in that. But uh, I, I'm more so interested in that feeling because I do believe it's important that we get back to just looking, you know, being in our bodies, I guess is what I'm saying, rather than hearing what, you know, is said on the news or by a friend. It's like, well, what's your experience of it, right? We've gotten so far away of thinking that someone else knows something more, a PhD knows more. It's just like, well, we're all nature. What's your experience of being you basically, right? So I don't know that. Um, and I don't think science will ever fully explain that, that mystery and the magic there of this connection that we have with nature yeah absolutely man that's really interesting because a lot of times i find you know if you're throwing facts at people if they already have an emotional feeling one way or the other it's not really going to sway them right so i think it's it's really important the qualitative elements as well as i think you know how you wrap that into storytelling it seems you yeah. know to 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 influence people uh but you hear numbers like you know if you're in a forest your blood cortisol levels you know they can measure this drop by 10 percent or whatever which is cool but i mean i already know that right yeah. from just my my own experience yeah. uh which is interesting and the other thing you know I, I really feel like there's different gradations of green because if i'm in a city park to be honest man it doesn't do shit for me right, it, it, right. Re it really doesn't I, has any of your research touched on that like the gradations between wilderness that's, to that's, park to 
Yeah, definitely. That's just the hardest part about studying nature is that we all come with our own definitions of what constitutes nature, right? So I'm here saying that we are nature, we're part of nature, right? Most people don't think of humans as part of nature anymore, um, at least in the modern world, right? 90% of us are in, in North America, are, or we spend 90% of our of our days indoors in North America, like 90% spent indoors. And, you know, we're, I, I think we're at what, 70, I think by the year 2050, they're predicting that 70% of the urban or the world population will live in cities, right? Um, and so, yeah, sorry, I kind of forget. I was going off on my rant as the disconnection. What was your question again there? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, totally. That's right in the vein of, uh, you know, the gradations of what is nature and <laughs> yeah. green, right? Like, like right. I was saying, city park yeah. doesn't really do it for me, man. Right. So we've all become removed. And yeah, same thing with me. I grew up with 10 acres of bush behind my my family home. And I, I was lucky enough that I you know, grew up on a farm too. So what I constitute nature, I mean, I remember in the past with, you know, partners in that just, they, they would say, oh, let's go for a, a nature walk. And they literally meant around the sidewalks in the city to like, and I was just like, that's, that's not a nature walk. I can't like, it doesn't, I don't get down like that. Right. So yeah, well, no. So that's to answer your question though, like the gradient of, of nature is one of the most difficult things. And it's saying nature is good for everybody. Right. Because it's, it's not people, my research looking at people's experience of connecting with nature in the forest. So people's experience of oneness with nature in the forest and how that's experienced. I mean, forest experiences aren't, you know, sunshine and lollipops for everybody. Forest can be a very scary place. And that's also what makes it so healthy at the same time right overcoming obstacles the the mystery of the unknowing whether a coyote is gonna you know or a bear is gonna run right in front of you like that type of thrill it's like it might be scary in the moment but when you leave and you you did that if it's something you've never done before you get filled with a sense of meaning in life and purpose and confidence and self-efficacy and and then the relaxation and the calm and the happy comes maybe not when you see the bear but like afterwards, like, wow, that was pretty cool. Right. So, I mean, uh, yeah, the experience of nature is really what gets me excited. And that's, uh, yeah, again, every, everyone's going to bring with them their own definition of nature. Absolutely, man. And you know what you said about that, that danger aspect to it, that's something that a city park lacks because there's mother nature, but I, I almost, I like to call it metal, like metal nature or, you know, uh, metal mother nature, something like that, because <laughs> It's the dichotomy, right? It's it's the spectrum of the experience. There's extreme beauty, but there's also danger, right? There's things that could eat you alive, asshole first, like a bear <laughs> or you know a pack of wolves or whatever. But that's yeah. what makes it so fucking cool. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, that yeah, city park just doesn't do it. I mean, I think there's other reasons because the city park there's still a lot of concrete. You can hear traffic, right? It's just it's just not the kind of kind of the same thing. Uh, what now with your research, Sean? Are you trying to come out of your research? to be able to almost diagnose people because I know you're working like on an outdoor school as well, setting up an outdoor and nature connection school is your objective to be like, listen, this is how, this is the optimal way to reconnect yourself. This is the duration of time that you kind of need. Yeah. This is the style. Is that what you're aiming for? Well, that's, that's essentially what is as a big push for that right now with uh, the Canada parks prescription initiative. That's uh, spanning. I think it's Dr. Dr. Tem, if I'm getting her name correct. Um, but yeah, this, this talk of, of prescribing nature is becoming more of the mainstream discourse, right? 10 years ago is probably would have been laughed at. Way I got, the way I got into nature research is before starting my PhD in Nature Connection, as you mentioned before we were getting on, um, I had a kombucha company in between there. But before my kombucha company, I was a physical activity researcher. So my claim to fame, at least as a personal trainer and, and internationally recognized uh, holistic health health coach, I was uh, actually that took me back to my master's. And I started working with exercises medicine. So that's the whole uh, initiative from American College of Sports Medicine, which is essentially trying to get doctors to prescribe physical activity. Now that work uh, made, gave me you can't tell them but it gave me gray hairs essentially, it was very difficult to try <laughs> to get doctors to prescribe physical activity. And essentially, anytime I would lecture at any, you know, uh, school or anything, any type of uh, medical school, I would get students that were already fit. I was basically preaching to the choir, right? They had no, like no prerequisites to, have to take physical activity or nutrition in, in medical schools. And so I felt like it was, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, that initiative made a lot of, of headway and it still is doing very well, I guess. But same thing, my, my, I guess I kind of become a little jaded because of that experience. And I'm thinking the same thing with um, doctors prescribing physical activity. So to your question there, yes, I am in the process of creating a nature connection school. Um, 
or a nature connection coach, if you will, that would be able to help whether you're a mental health professional or you're, you know, a, a strength coach and, and you want to be looking at your clients programming more holistically. Ideally, I would like to train individuals, call them nature connection coaches, ecotherapists, if you will, um, that are trained in all sorts of modalities. So not just forest therapy, which is where most of my research lies nowadays, but like, yeah, whether it be somatic experience in the woods or even using something like the heart map program to actually measure heart rate variability. My friend and co-host, Dr. Richard Vixinic, he's a naturopathic doctor. Um, and yeah, he's very keen on using these modalities. So right now it's, it comes to reinventing the wheel because we've never been involved in being so disconnected from nature. It's the time is now to protect not only nature for our health and well-being, but protect and learn how to kind of align our bodies with nature so that we're all working together, mother nature and our bodies, and we're living like harmoniously. So I think recreating ecotherapies or, or looking at different ways to do ecotherapies is a, yeah, I mean, it makes me excited. Um, there's a huge demand for it right now, especially after COVID and, and uh, you know, the, we're looking at the mental health impacts of lockdowns and, and uh, loneliness and things like that, right? So I think reconnecting with that which we are, that which we came from right now, it's kind of like a great way to go back, kind of like re- remembering who we really are, rem remembering that innate connection to nature in order to go forward, I think is really what is just uh, gets me out of bed, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Well, it's so powerful. I mean, I was just speaking with a friend yesterday and she was talking about how she recently started jogging on a daily basis, I think with her dog, uh, I think in the high park area. And uh, it's allowed her to drastically reduce the amount of uh, SSRI, her, her anti-depression and anti-anxiety oh, yeah. pills way, way down. And I've seen, you know, other relevant stories like that recently on, on social media as well. Even, you know, myself, if you do wind sprints or trail jogging or jogging of any kind, my God, the blood flow to the brain, you right. feel so good, so much positive emotion. I've even heard, you know, in a, another podcast recently, some neuroscience is talking about in terms of increasing neurogenesis in the human brain, oh. there's two things that above and beyond, you know, uh, compared to anything else, improve neurogenesis. One is aerobic fitness. And then the other one is dietary consumption of omega-3 DHA, which apparently makes up like a third of your brain or something like that. And um, the fact that doctors will not think about prescribing ecotherapy, whether it's in the form of jogging or going into, you know, camping, spending time in, in green spaces, it's absolutely mind boggling because it's so obvious. Like you said, you don't need quantitative data on this. You can go and experience it yourself. It's if you're feeling depressed, go for a fucking jog, man. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, green exercise. I mean, it's a great way to kill two birds with one stone, right? You're getting the physical activity. You might not be getting the, the mental calm, relaxation, stress reduction benefits of, um, you know, of nature. So, I mean, I think there's, there's multiple ways we can engage in nature, and, and you can do both, right? You can go for a hike in the forest trail, and then as soon as you notice yourself getting drawn into the flower or the sound of the leaves, it's just like, whoa breathe like you know just take that minute and just connect and um yeah i mean it, it, it and again we were talking about the city park not doing it for guys like us but the city park is plenty of nature for a lot of people right now and so connecting we can't under like you know don't want to uh i don't want to make it sound like nearby nature isn't it might be the antidote honestly because we do live in cities so redesigning cities with biophilic design and and uh you know people still have to value it we can't make people go out and get nature so but by having access to it in the cities i think we're going to have a huge you know, we, we could very well, um, one, get your physical activity running in, you know, jogging in the local park. But at the same time, you could find that favorite tree. And I mean, one of my favorite uh, psychotherapists is Carl Jung. And I believe he said, uh, a tree can tell you more than a book will ever tell you in a lifetime. And I'm totally butchering that quote, but it is. A Carl <laughs> Jung but it is, I mean, trees, trees, once we, once we connect with trees, they become friends, they are beings. And there is an unspoken connection there. And I think we have to just be open, getting out of our left brain again, getting into our bodies and just like, hey, that tree is beautiful. I want to hug that tree. And don't feel weird. Like that tree sees you. And, and there is something unspoken that I think science and, you know, getting into the materialistic, you know, reductionist type science, I think there will be some uh, science that comes out that shows how plants are communicating with us, right? Through looking at mycorrhizo fung fungi and all that stuff, which again, is not necessarily my area of research, but I think there's, there's something to be said there. And I do want to say just, just for listeners sake, cause we're trying to, I mean, I, I like to give practical stuff. I don't want to just be a talking head. I know me and you can riff and just laugh and chuckle, but I, I think, cause just, just this week, as I mentioned, I'm in this forest therapy conference 
And there was a, a slide that was, I did a screenshot of a slide because it was put together so well. Um, and it talks you to share it. You can share it if you want. Oh, I can share it. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Um, great idea. Because it talks about, now this was uh, Dr. Kathy Wolf, who I was, it was an honor to be um, on a panel with her. And there, I don't know, can you see that now? Yes. That's Kathleen Wolf right there. She is a, a long time, she's at University of Washington out in the West Coast and has done a lot of uh, research on ecology, eco psychology, and, and now into forest therapy and that. But her slide was perfect because I'm familiar with these studies that are listed at the bottom. So if folks are interested in, in nerding out after, they can, can download these. But um, you're looking at dosage for nat nature places and programming. So again, the quality of the, or the, the type of nature has to resonate with us first. Then also the amount of time, the dosage, like the frequency and duration. Um, so how many times a week, how long each time. This has been a, a big focus of research with a lot of pr predominant nature and health researchers within the last five years. Um, so again, it's been kind of an honor to switch out of the boring world of physical activity and dive into this stuff, which is really like me being a holistically minded health coach. This is really what gets me excited is looking at dose, dose like a dosing framework. So for stress, 20 to 30 minutes a day, um, a 20 to 30 minute session rather, not a day, but 20, 30 minute session. If you're feeling stressed out, you had a bad day, go out into nature and try to mindfully, just be mindful of nature, senses, smells, what's going on in your body, your breath. And eventually you'll start to feel what participants in my study call, I would say is grounding, right? So mm. grounding into the body. But then we look at depression um, or depression and blood pressure. You're looking to get greater than 30 minutes per week. Um, and that's, you know, if you have depression or if you have high blood pressure, you can actually take, get it's actually 20 minutes a day for blood pressure. will actually lower your blood pressure as much as a pharmaceutical, the current prescribed medication. Like, wow. Period, full stop. Like it, it works like medicine it is nature medicine. And then depression, um, one garden visit per week, which is like two thumbs up, growing your own food, getting your hands dirty. I believe that there's a lot of benefit that the, again, the world of reductionist science will be able to tell us with uh, getting our hands dirty in soil and the microbes that we're picking up and how that's influencing our gut microbiome, which our gut is like our second brain, right? So totally. not only physically are we connected to nature, but psychologically and emotionally, right? Depression, like, um, you know, feeling, feeling ill, feeling low, right? going out into nature lifts our spirits because these trees are, I mean, I'm going to say it the way I look at it personally is that these trees are beer beings living their fullest expression, just being right. A tree. It's not worried about what its hair looks like or this and that it's just being its full self and being around people who are confident in themselves or being around other beings like trees that are confident in who they are rooted, you know, in who they are tall and strong. Like these things bring lift our spirits as well. And so anyways, the last one is really neat, high well-being. So if you're looking for optimal health, and I know guys like you and me are often keen on the idea of like optimal health and, and that like thriving in life, right? Um, connecting with nature is a great way to flourish in life. And by spending 120 minutes per week in nature, which there is, you can, you can spend more in nature, right? If, if you have the time to do so, but look at two hours a week in nature. And again, whatever nature you connect with, wherever you feel safe and works for you is is two thumbs up here. We're not going to say you have to be out in the backcountry type thing, but yeah, two hours a week and you're looking at high well being. And it's also another thing that's not on this slide. And I guess I can stop sharing now. Um, is that uh, you're looking also to do a, a deep nature immersion at least once a month. And so yeah. like planning, like I, I love your videos. I love uh, all your camping videos that you're out there and like you're going off into the you know crown land and you're doing like this weekend getaway. Like to other people might look at it like your videos, you know, being out in the snow and doing a cold plunge. The cold plunge is hardcore. I'll, I'll admit being out there for overnight. I don't know if I'd throw myself into it unless the firewood was already chopped and ready. But yeah, no, like to go out there and be like, hey, I got what I need tonight. I know where I'm doing. Like I'm not out of my league. Maybe a little bit you're pushing yourself, but that's part of the benefit, right? To well-being. But yeah, you go out there once, once a month for two to three days on a weekend and you get those deep nature connection away from the city. And that's really where the benefits come. I know when I get those, I come back, I sit down in front of my laptop and I'm writing like a, like a madman, right? And it's just pure genius comes out, right? So these are the things that I've experienced. And yeah, science is now starting to, you know, back this up. So it's pretty cool. 
That's fascinating, man. A lot of those, those, you know, first four examples that you listed, you know, I've heard similar things like that. And that's super powerful, especially one about blood pressure, you know, the yeah. 30 minute exposure per week can reduce your blood pressure more than pharmaceutical drugs like that is mental. But especially that last one you talked about, but that deep immersion, you should do one deep immersion per month. You know, it's so funny that you have converged on that. I have also converged on that's kind of been my philosophy over the past six months is, People should now I basically go camping every other weekend, right? But uh, I say to people like you should get out camping at least once per month. And because the experience is complete, the depth of the experience is completely different. Um, It's Mm -hmm. so, 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 so powerful, so much more powerful, even I think than than trail running is Mm -hmm. Um, even the the fact that, you know, when you're camping at some point, you're going to be taking your shoes off. And your bare feet are going to be on the ground. You're spending more time in contact with the earth. I know there's a lot of, you know, a lot of quantitative research out there about grounding, about literally just being connected to the earth's uh, electromagnetic force, because I believe it's a slight negative charge. And by living on concrete and wearing rubber soled shoes all the time, we literally are no longer, we're dis- disconnected from that. We have no idea the potential negatives of, of that kind of thing. Right. But it's also about, like you were mentioning the stacking of, um, if you just go for a run on concrete, it's not as good as doing that in a city park, not as good as doing that on a trail run, not as good as probably camping, because mm-hmm. then camping is also most closely, uh, I think, replicating our evolutionary environment that we've spent 95% of our species existence in, which is as hunter gatherers, right? Mm-hmm. That mimics everything perfectly. The balance of aerobic to anaerobic exercise, the exposure to all these different kind of microbiomes, like you said, that example about gardening. There's a guy named Dr. Zach Bush, who is really about his whole thing is breathe your biome, right? It, getting your fingers on stuff is the best, but also even just being in a forced environment, um, breathing, you can breathe bacteria in and it gets on your skin and all this kind of stuff. This all has huge, you know, huge, it's hugely beneficial. And again, if you're walking on a concrete path in a city park, you're not going to get that same level of yeah. that kind of exposure, right? No, definitely not. Yeah. And that's why the deep nature like immersion is so I, I would say is so important. There's also the like, yeah, I think you, you, you hit the nail right in the head talking about the, the positive negative ion exchange, as well as just breathing in the bacteria. right. Think of like a like, again, I'm we're southwestern Ontario. So flat, arid uh, corn, soy, wheat fields everywhere, dry, arid air, right? Dead monocropped air, like glyphosate in the air. And so it's just like this dryness. I used to get nosebleeds as a kid when I worked on the farm. And just dry. And then I think of my land up, you know, in Canadian Shield now. And it's just like you walk in the forest and it's just like all the phytonocides and all the smells, just like the moisture. It's just, it's better for my skin. When I go up there, I instantly detox within the first 24 hours. One, I'm away from my screen, which I'm sensitive in, in the way of EMFs and things like that. But also just like my eyes, ears, nose, throat, mucus, lungs, everything's just like, hop, and I'm. I'm, I'm just talking whether I you whether you know it or not right so I mean there's so many benefits and yeah you hit the nail right in the head but I think the the deep nature immersion in the wilderness and this is where where my nature connection school kind of comes in if I may shamelessly plug it here is that these wilderness experiences like you know, like you know your videos and that where you're going out and overcoming I say overcoming but I shouldn't say overcoming but yeah yeah working with uh, you know in a reciprocal relationship listening to our bodies with the elements as to how to stay safe and, and, you know, have a good experience, have a nice fire and eat a steak or eat some frozen blueberries or whatever it is that you do there as you know, referencing your videos again. But um, this aspect provides us what's called eudaimonic well-being. So well-being, you know, I don't like to use the term mental health um, necessarily or mental illness for that matter, but the term well-being, I think over like psychological, emotional, spiritual, we can put all that into the word of well-being, right? Or wellness. And well-being, one way that it's been explained is that there's heat, hedonic well-being and then eudaimonic well-being. Hedonic well-being is that sense of pleasure, that instant kind of happiness we feel if we were gifted or we see a baby. It's that uh, the effective state of emotions that can change. That is that has been proven to increase in nature, in safe uh, places of nature. But the eudaimonic well-being piece this is that meaning in life, purpose, uh, feeling purposeful, uh, having life, life satisfaction, feeling like you have control of your life. These are these like these are the aspects of what's called eudaimonic well-being. And by going out into these wilderness, research has shown that by going out into deeper wilderness excursions, we're actually able to like build self self efficacy and kind of it's kind of like this personal development experience more so than just that 
oh, I'm happy because I got to go spend 20, 30 minutes in nature, right? So there's actually this long-term benefit where it's like, you can look at life like, yeah, I got that because I did that, right? And so again, sometimes seeing the bear, like I'm thinking of when I was in my vision quest, which is one of these experiences, four days, four nights in the woods, fasting from all things familiar and uh, facilitated, facilitated by some great uh, leaders um, of the quest. But one night I heard um, raccoons fighting. And of course my imagine, and I couldn't see anything. And it sounded like it was like 20 yards away from my little square circle, right? And I'm sleeping with a tarp over me on the ground. And, and it's like these raccoons just fighting. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like that's a bear. Meanwhile, bears weren't really in this area, but I'm like, just like what, or it's coyotes or what could it be? But anyways, um, turns out my rational brain the next day was able to realize, no, that's just raccoons. But that experience scared the shit out of me in the moment. But as I sit back and I tell you about it, I feel my like my lower Dantian, my lower core center. And I feel strong when I say it, right? Like, yeah. It, and people look at me like, you know, kind of laugh, like that sounds crazy, but like, yeah, it was a bit, but I'm here to tell about it, tell you about it. And I feel pretty good about it now. Right. So yeah, it gives you, it gives a sense of meaning. And, and I, again, like deeper meaning, whether you connect with nature in a spiritual way or just like seeing life and death unfold in the cyclical process and knowing that you're a part of it, like by immersing yourself deep in nature and seeing say an Eagle, come down and grab a squirrel you're able to kind of realize like get a sense of life and death and it makes you live more fully in each moment by having those experiences i would say oh dude a hundred percent i mean i i that makes so much sense to me so it's hedonic versus eudaimonic is that the yeah, term eudaimonic. yeah yeah hedonic versus eudaimonic and it's eudaimonic uh, very interesting because i've heard about you know hedonic pleasure and also like the hedonic treadmill which is the idea that there's only so much like the more pleasure you get, the higher your baseline moves. And then so if you're a rock star or Justin Bieber or whatever, right, your 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 baseline for that stimulus you need to set off your dopamine release becomes so high that you basically cannot experience pleasure in any way unless you do crazy amounts of narcotics or, you I'm know, not, are with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not one to like ever really shit like I'm, you know, having a political science economics background also. I'm not one to necessarily shit on capitalism blanket blanket statement, no. um, but like advertising, like our our culture right now, though, or, or or should say civilization. I don't want to say culture, but Western civilization, which is now spanning the globe. If that's our current civilization, is we call it Western advertising is such a big part of what informs us and how we go about our lives, whether we realize it or not. And I feel like there's this constant, like our culture, or again, our civilization, I should say, is so heavily weighted towards this hedonic, I just want pleasure, I want to lay yeah, on the yeah, beach, yeah. I want to retire on the yacht. And it's like, we're constantly seeking this, you know, dopamine hit, so to speak. Whereas if our life was just a little bit cl closer, deeply connected to nature, we'd start to realize, oh, some days it rains, some days it pours, you know, and you start to just kind of accept the fluctuations and the flows of the ups and downs of life, which, yeah, again, I think, uh, just huge benefit if we have these experiences and and why i'm excited to yeah finish my phd and actually get out there and start working with people again and whether that be coaching one-on-one -on -one or yeah like you know having a nature connection school so the time is now and i think uh there's guys like you and me like earlier you're saying how stacking things i think there's a lot of people coming from the health and fitness world um in, in all shapes and forms of it right um or science nerds so to speak where they're actually kind of getting out of the textbooks and out of the gym and into nature and they're starting to instead of reading the, the books like re instead of reading the scientific books reading like uh henry david thoreau or like leopold or these like uh wolf or ralph waldo emerson and uh his name's a tongue twister for me but <laughs> these guys who are very much like poetic and allow us to realize like we can all sit at the base of a tree and write down epically smart things and you don't have to be a scientist to do that right and it's like just by connecting with nature we're able to uh live an optimal life. So yeah, whether you're running in nature or sitting at the base of a tree, there's so many opportunities to be a, a full and a better human flourishing in life. Totally, man. And you know, the way that I've described that eudonic stimulus, is that the correct term? Eudonic? Yeah, eu eudaimonic, yeah. Eudaimonic, eudaimonic stimulus. I've almost described it as um, almost religious in nature. Like it's the, almost like the feeling, I don't know. Now, now tell me how this fits in. 
you get this feeling of awe in so many different experiences when you're in deep wilderness um, that you can't have, you know, if you're in a gym lifting weights or, you know, running on a treadmill, et cetera. Like when I was hunting last year, whitetail deer hunting for the first time, I was sitting on this ridge line. And one of the things I saw, I was for about an hour and a half, I was watching this red squirrel stash in his acorns away up in the tree. I'm like, it was just a fucking movie right there. But then out of the corner of my eye, there's this owl that swoops down through the canopy and it just took my breath. I was like, holy shit swoops down talons out the yes. squirrel sees him at the last second does like a neo in the matrix move to miss the talons and then <laughs> screws into his hole and then the owl stops himself with his wings and he's kind of stabilizing himself he sees me and he's like oh who's this fucker and then he just takes off right back straight up through the canopy and i was like oh my fucking god i have never all the years i've spent in the woods i've never seen something like that before and it was so it literally it was a religious experience because it was just awe, like all the terminology that I could use to describe that and its impact on me is religious in nature. And that must, that is that kind of the thing that you mean by eudaimonic versus hedonic? Yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. It strikes a chord in that you say religious. It's like, think of being in a choir in a church, even if you're not religious, that sound of, oh, like that yeah. is a primal sound that is like going back to chanting and the sound, ohm, ohm being the sound of the universe being created, right? So it's like that ah, oh, angelic and ah oh, is the word ah, oh, right? Awesome. Yeah, and so ah, yeah. oh, like ah uh, oh is one way to, is a doorway or a pathway to connect with nature. So by having that, you get essentially a download. And by the way, you keep hunt white tailed deer hunting long enough, you're going to see a lot of crazy squirrel, owl interactions. <laughs> which are, which are epic. Yes, I know exactly what we're talking about. Like. And um, yeah, it's, it's awe-inspiring, right? And those sense of connection, it, it connects beyond what you saw. It means something greater, right? It struck you at a deep, deep chord. And, and that's, um, yeah, again, awe being a pathway to connecting with nature and just the benefits of experiencing awe in itself, right? A lot of research on that and, and what, uh, what that's like to experience, right? So it's, it's beyond, like you say, just going in the gym and exercising. If you're out in nature, now I doubt you'll see the squirrel or the owl if you're running through nature, right? And that's the benefit of being slow and reverent and quiet. And like you're sitting in a tree, you're clearly concealed, right? The squirrel's doing its thing. The, the owl comes down, that's it. And it's, it, it was neat how you said it saw you. And that whole thing like is like, yeah, you're amongst like a god in the forest, like a killing machine out there. And it's just exactly. like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> owls aren't even scared of us too which is cool i've you know so many owl interactions they're so cool they're badass man they're badass and what so there are two aspects to that to what you just said the first one of which is uh, uh with that awe feeling that i felt right after i saw that part of it was a feeling of gratitude gratitude because of i was like oh my god we're on this rock hurtling through infinite lifeless space mm -hmm. And I was sitting on this ridge line, the only little rock that we know of that has life in the entire universe. And I just saw this thing happen. Yeah. And it was like, oh my God, I am so grateful to be fucking alive. I am yeah. so grateful to be a human that I don't have to worry about large predatory birds snatching me from the sky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was hard to get to that point. It was hard sitting because it had been freezing rain the entire morning. Hard sitting on that uh, that ridge line that entire morning to see that, but my God, it was worth it. Yeah. The second aspect to that would be um, the struggle that you have when you're out camping or hunting, spending time in the deep wilderness, as you say, because you have to struggle for everything. And I feel like sometimes now in society, you right. can buy these hedonic stimuli very easily. For example, Pornhub or OnlyFans or TikTok, you can receive this huge amount of stimulus with no price that you've paid. But in the wilderness, mm -hmm. just to get to your campsite and set up campsite and chop all the wood and cook your steak or, you know, catch a fish and cook it, there's such a huge output to do that. But once you've done it and you've eaten that meal, oh, my God, it's mm -hmm. the tastiest food you've ever eaten because you still have – you've got that duality that we've always had as hunter-gatherers that we've now ejected in modern civilization. And you need to have that duality of, like, that, that linkage there. And I guess on one level, right, you do struggle to earn money to buy things, but a lot of things are just completely free, right? Like a lot of things are like OnlyFans and Pornhub and Netflix and all that kind of stuff. So in terms of that, that gratitude and also the struggle to reward ratio, mm -hmm. does that fit into that eudaimonic category as well? Or how do you, yeah, how do, you do that? Definitely. I think the, uh, the struggling piece would be part of it. Um, now I'm just off the top of my head, there is some research that shows this. So very little research out there that looks at like 
let's send some people into nature and let's measure things like nature connectedness, which, you know, we can do through quantitative scales or ask them what that experience was like, um, and then measure different well-being outcomes. Um, gratitude is often something experienced after someone has it connecting with nature. So gratitude, you know, sense of gratitude can increase. But um, yeah, no, I think the struggle piece, there is some research out there that says that, but I would I would basically, I would like to see more research in that regard. So I could only like really speak to my own experience, I guess, in, in struggling in nature. Yeah. And it's, I think it's um, Stephen Rinella says this and I'll, I'll quote him here. Uh, it, it's like the things that are actually fun doing or worthwhile doing, they aren't fun while you're doing it. They've got a whole lot of suckiness, rain, freezing rain. But then later when you look back at it, it's like, whoa, that was like, like, I think he says, uh, you know, and I was just at a festival the other day, riding the Ferris wheel with my nephew. And it's just like, this is fun because I'm there with my nephew. So it's a blast. But like, if I'm just thinking about it in, like, if I was there by myself, just on a Ferris wheel, I'm like, this is supposed to be fun, which sure, it's giving me a little of that hedonic pleasure. But then I, I get off and I forget about it. You know what I mean? Yep. Anyway, um, so it's like, but these things where I've had these experiences in nature, it's just like, yeah, these are these are the lasting things that I'm thinking, like, are making me grateful to be alive, right? They are they are making me realize that, um, you know, I won't always be here, right? And I think it's just, there's a wisdom that comes from exiting our head and entering our body and what's right in front of us. It's it, it's like meditation anyways. And this is the experience of a lot of participants in my research is one of the main themes is this meditative aware state that we reach in the forest. One, the forest beckons that from us because there are essentially risks. You could step on an uneven ground and twist your ankle, right? So proprioceptively, we have to be more aware when we're into the forest. But once we're in the forest and we're just being in the forest and not thinking about the to-do lists and, hey, I'm this or that or whatever the ego human, uh, the, the ego wants to say, like the ego feels comfortable there because it's relaxing. Like I feel like, oh, this is a good place for me. But then the ego kind of disintegrates, right? And then, and, and then once we're there just being in nature, this is where like I see myself as like, again, you say religious or a spiritual connection. It's like, I see myself as a just part of this process. Like you see the oneness in nature. And I think that's where it's like, again, our scientific westernized, you know, modern day civilization, we try to compartmentalize and separate everything into separate parts and try to understand it where it's like being in nature for long periods of time. We start to see the oneness of everything, how everything revolves on one another right absolutely man that that brings up two two thoughts in my mind first of which is the thing about meditation uh you know i saw some paper on that recently about how you know 30 minutes in actual like wilderness will stimulate the same mental state as meditating for i think the similar amount of time and i think yeah. like you said me watching that owl try to take out that uh, squirrel or even the squirrel by himself mm -hmm. i'm not in my own mind when i'm watching that i am completely thinking about something else it's like almost putting your attention on something else and it has nothing to do with your internal dialogue whatsoever and it really is meditative in sense and when you're in nature and you're camping and you're out there um for an extended you know period of time it's almost like you're in that meditative state for the entire time which is an amazing feeling because you have to struggle so hard mightily to sit down and meditate you know in your home but when you're out there it's almost like it's it's uh, it's automatic, yeah. um, and then the other thing would be, in terms of the the the, the separating all of these things, the reductionism um, in you know modern whatever uh, the scientific method and, and approach and everything. What I find so interesting about a lot of the biohackers out there, like you know Dave Asprey and Ben Greenfield and all these kind of guys, it's like at the end of the day, what they're really talking about is measuring the effects of rewilding because so much of what the stuff they do is they're just trying to quantify the benefits of basically a natural lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. And what's so weird about that is, I mean, I guess it can be, you know, even a lot of the stuff that Andrew Huberman does and stuff, it's like, hey guys, you should put infrared lights on your nut sacks for 20 minutes upon waking up. It's like, right. okay, yeah. you mean like when you get up from like the campfire in the morning and you're walking naked before, you know, just outside or mm -hmm. whatever the example is, right? Right. You can recreate all of those things in the right proportions if you're just out there in the wilderness living like a wild human would be, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you yeah. can try to recreate it in civilization for certain people that can never get into the woods. I mean, I guess that's useful, but the best way to do it, it's not biohacking. It's really, it's really rewilding. Does that make sense to you? Like, do you think oh, yeah. that a lot of biohacking is just, it's, it's, quanti it's quantifying the benefits of rewilding, right? Yeah. Trying to, uh, I called it wild hacking. Like I, 
trying to mimic the health benefits of nature through technologies and doing it fast, essentially, right? So zooming out and yeah, kind of looking at health more holistically and realizing the impacts of like the elements is the way I, so air and breathing, uh, sun, right? So infrared, as you mentioned, things like that. Um, fire, right, is an element. So thinking of saunas um, and then the opposite of fire being cold plunges being like all these, you know, technologies that are mimicking the health benefits of nature. And so, yeah, I mean, I've been there. I've been a young you know, overachiever, um, the Canadian Ben Greenfield, I, when I did my podcast back in the day, I've been called that many a times and I was there and it's that go, go, go fast, 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 read all the books and try to learn things. But that has an aging effect. It has an opposite effect of, of what I think all those biohackers are trying to do. You're, you know, you're speeding up the, the healing process of the body and maybe your body isn't ready to heal in that way yet because there's a psychological or even just a, some type of other, like a spirit, there's a mission that your body's supposed to be on, but you haven't yet found that because you're so immersed in books and culture and, and, and learning and biohacking. So I think that's, yeah, I think right now, like there's this time where even you see people like these biohackers, like Ben Greenfield, changing the name of his podcast, the Ben Greenfield from Ben Greenfield fitness to Ben Greenfield life. And you're hearing him speak about spirituality and writing books on spirituality and hauling water and chopping wood and and I mean, there's kind of a, it's kind of a paradox, but that's, I'm cool with paradox because that's when, you know, you're really living where it's like, wait a minute, you're about science and measuring all this stuff. But then now it's about like actually just getting back and slowing down. So what I'm getting as I think maybe as I'm aging, but I also think it's indicative of the times is that we're all kind of going from this fitness world of like quantitative measurements and like overachieving and get there fast and realizing, especially over the last two years, it's slow, like just, just slow down. Right. And this is the return to nature. And then we realize, like, well, I don't need to spend five grand on the sauna. If yeah. I just commit to, you know, getting a lot of sunlight or whatever it is, putting blue light block glasses, like, yeah, we can use these biohacks, but I think uh, going there first, I think we're actually like speeding up our, our, our death in a way. almost. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, I mean, I think it's one of the problems with scientific reductionism is that the human human biology and psychology is so complicated. It's like the complex systems, right? Yeah. Trying to identify a single mechanism within the body, you might be able to discover that and discover how to toggle it up and down, mm -hmm. but you don't even know all the knock-on effects, all the other, the other implications it has for the other systems of your body. With how advanced our science is, we still have no fucking idea what the overall cascading effect is. And again, this goes back to the, it's the, uh, it, it's the evolutionary environment. Yeah. Go camping, man, for your weekend. One one weekend a month. I mean, that's my mantra. That sounds a, it's like your, you know, that's what your mantra is. That's what you're trying to set up this uh, this nature connection school um, in central Ontario for. And uh, it just makes so much sense because we have no idea all the holistic connections, interconnections between all of these things, right? Because yeah, you could be be shining, you know, infrared light on your face for 20 minutes in the morning, but um, it's leaving out so many other things. Mm -hmm. that you would get if you were just waking up from a campfire in the morning and you're out in the woods, right? Definitely. We don't live in Petri dishes. And, and as you're meant, like you're saying, like it's a, uh, this is the beautiful thing about eco psychologies. It takes, uh, it, it's basically looking at uh, ecology and psychology um, and kind of questions this whole inner, inner psychology and outer ecology. Like we, we literally are one, right? So um and I, I kind of forget where I was going exactly with that, but yeah, I, I think just understanding that we are, we are one with nature um, and just starting to see that put into practice. Right. Because um, yeah, it's like, we can, we can learn all the sciencey stuff we want outside of ourselves, but our experience of nature is really what's most important. Absolutely, man. And the thing, like if you go hiking with someone like that experience, you know, we've had with, uh, with squirrels and, uh, and owls, uh, and their eternal battle in the forest. Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing is like when you ask more pe most people like, do you like nature? And they go, oh yeah, I love hiking, right? Because their idea of hiking is every Sunday after brunch, you know, they go out, they go hiking for an hour or two, which is great, right? It's better than not doing anything at all. But Ooh. you're not gonna get the fucking full experience, man. Because when you're ch stomping around, you're yakking back and forth. Oh my God, what people don't realize is the critters in a yeah. half kilometer radius around you, they fucking disappear. Oh yeah. They yeah. completely disappear, man. Um, I'll give you one small example is up at my cottage, which is on a 200 acre island in central Ontario. And I had seen like one deer over the years, nothing else. I'm like, oh, there's nothing on the island that's separate from everything. I started putting up trail cameras and then putting up four trail cameras. And I discovered, oh my God, 
there's black bear regularly, there's moose, there must be like 10 resident deer on the islands, there's beavers, there's porcupines, there's all of these critters. Mm -hmm. And so that's one example of like, you gotta, you gotta interact with nature in a different way than just stomping around and hiking because you're not going to see all these things, right? Um, it's Definitely, uh, no, I, think, I think that's like, I was asked the question, what should, because I my research looks at people who value connecting nature and what their experience is, very rich experience, like I'm trying to get at this experience on like that high level for people who really value it, what is it like? But the opposite question of that would be, what is it like for people who, you know, aren't connected with nature, right? And so I think, you know, as you're talking about seeing animals come back, it's about being quiet and reverent. So if you are looking to really connect with nature and you're used to just going on that Sunday br after brunch walk, chatting, it's like try once to just like have a five minutes moment of silence where you're actually just like quiet and you're kind of, you know, sensing out like, being open to your experience rather than just, you know, the conversation with a friend or what have you be open to your experience. And it's amazing to see like what type of like critters and things you'll, you'll notice for the first time. And that newness of nature that, that excites the brain, right? Cause like we often get habitual, you know, humans are habitual creatures. So we can get stuck in, in that, especially in this day and age, if we go out in the nature and just be open to the experience, the newness of it, um, it's very, it's a very good care, like personality trait is to be open to new experiences, right? Things are always changing and nature teaches us that. However, we get kind of stuck in our ways, right? So again, I think just by being in nature, you can just kind of get a new perspective on, on life in general, right? But Absolutely, yeah. man. Absolutely. And you know, it's one interesting thing that I think is not unique to nature is we were talking earlier about the struggle to reward ratio. And if there's no struggle for a reward, um, it's dangerous because then that reward has no meaning, right? Like being able to jerk off to uh, OnlyFans or Pornhub without actually having to, you know, struggle for that or, you know, watching Netflix yeah. or whatever. Even the price of food now is yeah. so minuscule compared to our earning power. It's almost like there's no struggle for food, even though you do have to earn money to get it compared to if you're watching these wild critters, right? Like that owl. Uh, yeah. working his ass off or that squirrel working his ass off just to get enough food to survive. Right, right. Um, totally. The interesting thing about that to me is that you, we can actually recreate that in human civilization. It's mm -hmm. like, just because you can do certain things doesn't mean that you should. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you should look at the, the dopamine or the, uh, the hedonic pleasure that you're getting in your life and anything that you're not struggling for, you mm -hmm. should really question, listen, nature has not designed anything that you get for free. Yeah. And I should be wary of this because I could be doing significant either biological or psychological damage to myself yeah. without, do you know what I mean? It's even like you could say for casual sex, like yeah. you can very easily go onto Tinder or Bumble or whatever and be having sex with a different partner every day of the week. It's like, but what are the dangers of that? I mean, beyond, you know, sexually transmitted diseases and stuff like that, but um, you're also cheapening the value of sex. I've even seen data recently that shows the more sex, the number of sexual partners in your life is positively correlated to the probability that you end up in divorce, which yeah. I don't know, you know, there's many, there's many variables in there, yeah. obviously, but that's very interesting. Um, that's so that's do you great, think great that that whole struggle to reward thing, does that, does that, um, does that interest you? Have you seen that come out in your, in your, in your research? Well, I guess this is kind of remind me of the point that I just previously forgot about and, and that there's, there's no biological free lunch. And so what I mean by that, like you can't, like you're saying, we aren't, we don't live in Petri dishes and we can't just do this and expect that we can't just watch Pornhub without expecting like all the time watching Pornhub, expecting some type of opposite end. So it's, there's the, polarity of all things in our life so if we're constantly binging on this there's a lesson to be learned that's going to probably hit you in the ass and the other on the other way out right like so it's yeah. like the divorce, thing, the divorce thing i mean it makes perfect sense to me I've, I've been out of balance in my life before working too hard on projects and having relationships fall apart right so it's like there was a lesson to be learned there and and if we're open to learning it and seeing that life isn't always sunshine and lollipops by being in nature more it's like you you look at those as teachers right those opportunities so and that's what i was yeah essentially going to say before is that like eco psychology looks at things as a systems theory right we don't just it's not just like okay like take mono monocultured crops conventional farming for example you spray the the roundup on the corn and gets rid of the weeds the corn grows great awesome three four five years later rolls around the weeds are learning the bugs are learning 
how to adapt to the glyphosate. So they become stronger, right? And so oh, spray them with this. And it's linear thinking applied to a more of a holistic reality, right? And again, that reduction of science has benefits in understanding the parts and pieces. But we have to incorporate that into the reality of being in this world, right? Being, we have to be in reasons. We have to be in our bodies, but also have reason, but not let the reason in the right brain or the scientist just tell us how to do things, right? We have to like look at things in a systems theory. So I think, um, yeah, again, there's, there is no biological free lunch. And so we have to, I think by default, have to have those struggles. Um, it's part of the whole system and to remove the pain from life right? Um, and just have pleasure all the time. It's, it's just not possible. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, it, we're, I think, constantly on this ascent of humanity, thinking that we can, you know, we once believed in, in gods, and, and now we believe in science. And there's this like, ascension, ascension that's happening. But I don't see it as, as that when I look at people's experience of daily life, when you look at depression rates, you look at obesity, and all these problems, it's like, we're, we're ascending right now. Like, it's just like, again, this is that remembering to return or to you know, return to an old way of doing things in the now. I don't know. Absolutely, man. Like, you know, well, I mean, oh, yeah. that that dichotomy between struggle and reward and, and some of these other things that we're, we're talking about, it's almost like they give meaning to one another, right? Like without the other half of the spectrum, you, the other thing doesn't mean anything. And that's uh, that duality is, I think, un, in, in, inescapable. Um, and what's so interesting is I think that we're using a lot of our technology now to try to escape that duality. But then the problem is, is meaning collapse, because without the other side, right? If you're never cold, warmth doesn't mean anything, right? If you're constantly at 72 degrees Fahrenheit every single day, day of the uh, day of the week, uh, every single hour of the day, um, got no got no context to to put reality in. If that's just how we're going to remove and like you know plastic wall or like you know rubber wall kind of make everything so neat and tidy, it's like it's just it's just a it's just a slippery slope. And to think that's ascension or getting better and overcoming this body, it's like no, let's create unity with it because. I mean, again, this is the story that's been going on since I think the Bible was written, right? People, kings trying to, you know, overcome the king of kings or however you want to put this, right? Like there is this mystery to life um, that I don't think we can fully explain. And I think the sooner we accept that, um, the better our, well, I mean, the sooner we're connected with ourselves, we're connected with nature, we're going to start treating nature better, we're going to treat one another better. And it's just like, for me, it's creating this, like, in my mind, I think rewilding as a way of like, totally redesigning the world. And I know it sounds a little idealistic, but I mean, in these times, it's like, this is, this is a time for ideas, right? Despite most ideas that I try to share get censored, but I digress, right? <laughs> <laughs> these are the ideas we got to keep talking about. So I, you know, the opportunities to chat about them with you and anybody, you know, the whole podcast thing, it's like, you can't, despite technology having its downfalls, like here we are getting to share ideas like this still, um, despite they might, you know, not let us on people on planes together or certain times, you know, you're not allowed at the bar anymore to talk, but like, Hey, if we have this technology and we can still communicate like this, these ideas, you know, you can't get rid of these ideas. Cause uh, yeah, it's about, it's about happiness and health and being fully human and, and yeah, just living a life. That's a good life. Right. And uh, yeah, people want that. So. Absolutely, man. Well, I think it, there, I think there's a few more points here to wrap up and then there, I'd love to do another podcast with you in the, in the, in the coming months about uh nature religion uh about psychedelics and then also your thoughts on um on, on covid and uh yeah. and and the vaccines and and all that stuff from you know this kind of i think like rewilding and, and nature connection perspective and all the perspectives you have on that so i'd love to talk about all those things with you and uh but just to wrap up this you know i think it's something you mentioned about the bible because i believe in the bible the old testament it mentions something about god created human because what does the only thing that an infinite being lacks? Because God is all seeing. It's what omnipresent, omniscient, and on, omnipotent. Those three things, all seeing, all knowing, all being. Uh, a infinite being, the only thing it lacks is the finite. So that's why it created life, finite life, right? But what's so interesting about the trajectory that humans are on with our technology is that we're approaching godlike status because if you think about what the our ancient ancestors thought of as gods you know people riding around in chariots in the sky right like thor pulled by his two super goats and stuff like that we're basically omniscient omnipresent and whatever the other one is all seeing all that we can fly anywhere in the world in 24 hours you can speak to anyone on the planet with facetime like we are now right instantly and you have all of the world's uh, knowledge at your fingertips, you can access, you know, immediately. And the mm -hmm. same things can be said, you know, pleasure is free, food is almost free, all of these kind of things. 
Um, so it's almost as if we're, you know, basically what the ancient peoples warned us about, as well as, you know, pursuing pleasure, which so much of our scientific atheist perspective is, what's the meaning of life? Pursuing pleasure, right? It's almost like we're ignoring all of these warning signals about what not to do, because the idea that, oh my God, once our technology grows to a point where we are like gods, we're going to be happy. But it's like, wait a minute, once you're God and you're limitless, nothing means anything. I think yeah. it's something like in the Iliad when the, you know, the, the, the Greeks are at, uh, at Troy. I, I forget who says this, but I think it's maybe Achilles. He's like, the gods envy us because we are finite. We can die at any time. And I think this goes back to that whole, the, the duality that you see in nature, right? That everything has, every reward has a risk or a struggle tied to that. And that's what gives everything meaning, right? Like that, the squirrel and the owl, right? Struggling just to stay alive. Everything, finding an acorn if you're a squirrel, oh my fucking God, yes, that's amazing. But if you're a God, you live forever, you're everywhere, you know everything, nothing has any meaning. So the reason I'm bringing this up, Sean, is because a lot of people, when I talk about rewilding, they're like, you're just a fucking Luddite. You're looking backwards. It's like we're, technology is looking forwards. But I think the whole thing about rewilding is this. It's like what we're saying, we're essentially taking a conservative position, which is, listen, all the stuff we're trying to do we have no fucking idea if it's good for us or not mm -hmm. and be very cautious about doing all this new crazy shit, right? Do you have that, that, that feeling like rewilding is not regressive. It's actually pro progressive. It's remembering. It's remembering all the lessons that, yeah, the ancestors and in, in that, that have learned that we aren't all seeing, you know, we do take joy in finding the, the acorn or the good dry piece of firewood. Like, and that's what makes life worth living. Cause if we, were to be all seeing this would mean nothing to us and so yeah i mean i think understand that mystery of we're here on earth we think we know everything we're in the cosmos right and that understanding of the mystery of life right and looking at even the human cells physics will show us this stuff that like my cells are 99.99 percent .99 space empty space right so it's like we have to humble ourselves and that's what science should be doing is giving us humility in like, you know, understanding these grotesque bodies that like, you know, we have to wrestle with this, but at the same time, we are space, we are the infinite, right? But we aren't that while we're in this body because we have our ego lens on, right? That allows us to enjoy the pleasures of, of life. And that, like you say, the gods envy us most, most definitely to have love for another, like it means nothing once we, you know, once we leave this earth, it's, it's here now. So I think having the understanding that we aren't that all seeing all, you know, all being, um, but we are part of it, I think, yeah, is, is a, is a beautiful thing. And I think it's a lesson that we're all kind of learning right now in our own ways, right? Um, whether or not it's a conscious learning, but I think we're all learning these types of lessons to humble ourselves in our sciences and our, in our facts and thinking that everything is, you know, finite and definite it's just like yeah i think it's a, i think it's an interesting time to be alive i have this just great transition this remembering of of all these ancient wisdom and that's why we're seeing things like indigenous cultures being praised for their thousands of years of connecting with nature now i mean we're all connected to nature but i do think that like understanding that um there's wisdom that's been lost in this ascension or in this you know pursuit of scientific knowledge we've lost a lot of stuff and we have to bring that back and i'd say embody it but it's already embodied we just have to wake up the remembering and you know the senses and what a great way to do that but head into the forest head into nature and just be mindful of what's around you yeah absolutely man yeah. absolutely yeah. so uh so how um how you've given a lot of great tips today about how to uh to to connect with nature for your health it sounds like the 30 minutes in actual kind of like green wilderness is the bare minimum on a weekly basis. But if you're talking about 120 minutes per month, that's ideal, right? 120 minutes per week. 120, 120 minutes per week is for really optimal the, health. for optimal. optimal health. Okay. And then on top of that, uh, doing at least once a month for what it would be like two days or three days, actual deep forest experience, wilderness even, experience. Even just like, if you don't have that opportunity, sleep outside. If you've got a little garden or backyard, like yep. go sleep there. if there's like a local city campground, like when I lived in the city of London, um, that we have Fanshawe Conservation Area. It's, mm -hmm. it's on the edge of the city. I could still hear and smell the built environment, if you will. But it's just like, um, yeah, that was perfect. Set the tent up. If it rains, it's raining. Okay. 
but I'd cook meals and just live out there. And it was just like, yeah, it was perfect. So nearby nature can't be, can't be, uh, you know. And you know, one thing to point out for people in North America is public land, right? It's known as crown land here in Canada. So Ontario is bigger than the country of France in terms of surface area. And 75% of Ontario is crown land. So people often thinks about, you know, like when I ask people, have you ever gone camping? Like, oh, I haven't been to Algonquin Provincial Park in a long time. I'm like, no, dude. There's something called crown land, baby, and it's uh, free. You can go out there. So people who are like, that's the other thing is it's so cheap to do this. You can buy some equipment off of Amazon for maybe 100, 200 bucks and get out there for free. You don't have to go to a provincial park, right? In the U.S., you can go to public land, which is mainly in the West. There's more in the West than there is in the East, but there's just so much free availability to do this stuff, right? Yep. Yep. You go to Disney World, you spend 10 grand in a week for a family of four, dude. Yeah, exactly. that's expensive you go camping for a week oh my god it's so much cheaper it's so much cooler um but that's great man and then also your uh your school what's the timeline on your school opening man yeah so i'm uh like i said just finishing data analysis now so i hope to have this finished and wrapped up in the next couple of months so i'll be defending this kind of early fall i guess and then uh from there publishing a few papers um and uh yeah from there it's 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 course creation i've i've been creating courses for this school for a little while um working on how exactly i'll work with clients and doing like ecotherapy or eco psychology if you will so getting back to like a an actual me being an actual health coach if you will and so uh yeah so uh, hitting the ground running here is, is 2023 goes so ideally i'd love to have like you know a website up and start trying to uh yeah spread the good word i guess so that's great man that's great and where can people follow you on the interwebs where where should they go well, I am I am on Instagram. Uh, it's at Rewild My Bio there. And then uh, you can yeah check out the website. It's got a, I got a newsletter that I'll do on occasion if, if I got something worthy of, you know, sending out. But as you know, like I, I, I think we recorded one last year and then I really picked up the pace with PhD studies. So the podcast has kind of been put on hold, newsletters put on hold, but the idea is to the content creation. I put the cart in front of the horse, so to speak. I didn't realize how busy I would be with school, but uh, but I'm really looking forward to, well, I guess getting internet up north. And then once I have that, we can have conversations like this again. So I, I appreciate this. And uh, I'm so pumped to hear that you're doing a podcast. And uh, yeah, this is wicked. Yeah. And again, I'd love, I'd love to talk to you uh, soon again about uh, nature religion, like formalized yeah. nature connection, and then uh, also psychedelics and then also the, all the yeah. COVID stuff. So yeah, dude, thank I you so it. much. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is great. I yeah, appreciate dude. It. All the Godspeed, best. man. Godspeed.